Hey everybody, thanks for joining today, whatever day it happens to be or whatever time of day it happens to be for you today. I happen to be recording this in the early afternoon on Friday, so uh, a little bit better than last week, not a whole lot better. So it's amazing how busy you can get sometimes and I don't know why it is, but my wife and I have stayed really, really busy uh, over the last few weeks and we'll probably be busy over the next several weeks, but that's okay. Uh, the title of today's lesson is Reconcile, Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. Acknowledging God's sovereignty helps us seek reconciliation with others. And guys, this, to me, this is such an important lesson today. Uh, it just speaks to the importance of being forgiving. Um, and it's just an amazing um way that Joseph had forgiven his brothers. And, and we'll really delve into that today and look at that. And before we do, let's just go ahead and, and bow for a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you so much for this example today of what forgiveness looks like. Father, we know that there is no greater act of forgiveness than what you've done through your son being on the cross to die for our sins. But Father God, we see even earlier than that, that uh, you allowed Joseph to set that example for us, even though he had been wronged, that Father God, he was he had a forgiving heart and he saw your plan in action long before anybody else did. And Father, we just thank you so much for that. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth. Father, we thank you for loving us and we thank you for forgiving us. God, this morning, I ask that you forgive us of our sins. I ask that you forgive me of my sins and that, uh, Father, you just help me to be more like you. Be with us, Father, as we study your word. Speak to our hearts, and it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. All right, so uh, just as, as we jump into this today, guys, a um, couple of questions. Number one, what is forgiveness? And you may look at that and say, well, that's kind of a silly question. What do you mean, what is forgiveness? Everybody knows what forgiveness is. But you know, it's, it's kind of like letting someone off the hook is the way I look at it is someone has done you wrong and rather than holding that against them, rather than holding them accountable for an extended period of time, you simply say, I forgive you and you, you let them off the hook. Someone has caused harm in your life or maybe even worse in the life of someone that you love and, and you no longer hold ill feelings or ill will against that person. Uh, and I'm sure that's not the textbook definition, but that's the way my mind deals with forgiveness. And I look over here, it says, though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgave them all. And that's what it gets to be overwhelmed by sin. That's where we are as, as uh, just people who walk this earth. We are sinners, each and every one of us. So why is forgiveness so difficult? Why do we find it difficult to forgive others? And I think it really just boils down to hurt. If we've been hurt or harmed by someone, it's very difficult to let go of that. You know, and I think it's easier to forgive someone the, cement, the sins committed against someone we don't know. So someone has done a horrible thing. Uh, for instance, uh, let's just say that a banker embezzles money from some great big bank out in San Francisco. And they come out and they say, you know what? I've changed. I asked for forgiveness. I'm sorry. Hey, I get it. Yeah, you seem sincere, so forgiven. But somebody takes money from your personal account. They embezzle from you, and it causes a great deal of difficulty going forward trying to clear your name. Well, that might be a little bit more difficult to forgive. So why should we do it? Why should we forgive? Well, Ephesians 4.32 says, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God forgave you in Christ. So we see that there's been an example and that example was set by God that, that God forgave us. Oftentimes, I think we withhold forgiveness until the offended party has done enough begging or, or we believe that it is done in the right way, that they're sincere enough. All right. Maybe somebody has apologized, but they just didn't seem sincere. So, nope, I'm going to hang on to that unforgiveness. Uh, all the while, we allow that unforgiveness to eat away at our own souls. And I'll get into that a little bit later in the lesson. But 
Um, I, I think that's really what it boils down to is when we harbor these ill feelings, certainly it can cause harm to others, but it really does probably more damage to ourselves and to our own souls. So let's go ahead and look at the first set of verses and it's entitled, or, or I'm sorry, we'll do a little background, then we'll jump into those. So after having revealed what Pharaoh's dreams meant, Joseph rose to become the second most powerful man in Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh even gave him his signet ring and said, here, you know, you act on behalf of Pharaoh. So he was placed in charge of the storing of food for preparation of the famine, then the distribution of the food once the famine hit. That was a, that was a big, big role that he's playing here. So Jacob, or after God had named him Israel, sent all of his sons to Egypt to buy grain a couple of years into this famine. He sent them all except for Benjamin but they didn't recognize their brother Joseph. So Joseph used that uh, as a way to kind of trick them into bringing their brother back with them. He sent them on their way and, and he, rather than um, uh, letting them pay for the grain, when they stored the grain in their sacks, they had them put the money back in so that it looked like they had stolen money from Egypt. Uh, but but when he called them on it, they left Simeon as a prisoner. He said, go back and bring everybody. I want to see even your little brother. And as he had known, Jacob sent his sons back to buy grain and relented to allow Benjamin to go with them. So, you know, Jacob knew that, hey, we can't survive without grain. So, you know, Joseph knew that he was going to send them back to get it. It's the only way they could survive. So Joseph had a meal prepared for them at his home and had them brought there. They're like, why in the world are we going to this powerful man's home? They knew that they were in more trouble and, and that now they had placed Benjamin at great risk. See, they were still clueless. So he sends them back and, and he places uh, one of his, he has them place one of his, uh, I think, goblets in uh, Benjamin's sack. And then he sends people after them and he goes, look, you stole from me. Why would you have stolen from me? You got to come back now. So uh, Judah had asked Joseph to keep him as a slave and return Benjamin to his father. And that's, that's where we pick up. So 45 uh, verses one through three, Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all of his attendants. So he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with them when he revealed his identity to his brothers, but he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and also Pharaoh's household heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. So what caused Joseph to lose his composure? People lose their composure for many reasons. I've known people to lose their composure because they were angry, they were anxious, they were upset. They all, all sorts of emotions cause people to lose their composure. And maybe it was, you know, their deception. You know, and, and he's holding that in. He knows who they are and they don't know who he is. And he's deceiving them. And he says, you know, I can't wait. But guys, I think most probably it was the joy at seeing his family for the first time in, in many years. They're all, he and his brothers are all together and he's meeting Benjamin for the first time. And hiding emotions, guys, is very difficult. And there are times that it's important that we do so. Um, you, you might be upset about the way something went down and you could either blow up and react or you cover those emotions for the time being and you dwell on them, you think about them, you pray about them, and then you deal with them. Uh, uh, but Joseph was overcome with emotion in that moment. And I think it was joy. So why did Joseph send everyone away but his brothers? Why didn't he allow others to see what was going down? And I think partly it's because this was their time. They're a family and he wanted to reveal this to them and just to them. But he also knew that he was about to get very emotional and he didn't want others to witness it. Certainly not the Egyptians. As a man who has a great deal of power, you know, you see a picture of this man crying right here. And oftentimes we don't want people to see our tears. Yeah, that's my phone. Sorry about that. Uh, but as a man in power, it may have seemed like a weakness to display his tears. But guys, they were going to hear it. As it says in these, you know, 
later on in, in these verses, the Egyptians heard it, Pharaoh's household heard it, everybody heard what was going on because he cried, he wailed, the emotion just escaped him. So why do you think his brothers did not answer him directly when he said, is my father still living? Why didn't they say, well, of course he is. Why didn't they respond? And I think part of it is they were in shock that they knew that he was sold into slavery. Egypt was a big country. There are millions of people. What are the odds that this Egyptian official, the second most powerful man in all of Egypt would have been their brother? And they just now realized who he was. And once they did, I, I think their guilt seized them. They saw him and, and they were like, oh my goodness, this, this is Joseph. And oh my goodness, this is Joseph. This is the one that we had already condemned to die. And then when, when Reuben talked us out of it, we sold him into slavery. Oh no, I mean, we're about to just get lit up and we deserve it, right? I mean, they know they deserve it. Guess how do we deal with unresolved conflict in our family. How do we deal with that? And yes, many people simply ignore it as long as they can, and they allow the hurt, the contempt, the unforgiveness to simply grow into something worse, and they let it grow into hate. If you think about that, so unforgiveness can grow to be hate. And after a while, yes, that just seems normal. And it seems justifiable. Yeah, I, I hate him. I hate my brother. I hate my sister because she did me wrong and, and never, never apologized like she should have or, or something of that nature. And we justify that. And that just becomes the new normal. And hate becomes the new emotion. But hate tends to corrode the vessel in which it is carried. Think about that, guys, for just a minute. Hate corrodes the vessel in which it is carried. Uh, I can't remember who quoted Barbara Bush, but somebody uh, had said that, I think it was Alan Simpson, said that Barbara Bush had told him that, and uh, he had never forgotten it. You see, God hates sin, but he loves the sinner so much that he gave his one and only son so that we might be forgiven. Yes, that's, that's what God demonstrates. Are we above God that we withhold forgiveness? Because I think sometimes we can hurt so much that we think we deserve to be able to withhold forgiveness. I, I just do. And I, and I think it's wrong, guys. I think God demonstrates that that's wrong. All right, let's go ahead and look at the next set of verses. If I can get there. And it's verses four through eight, God sent me. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. And they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Gosh, that's, that's amazing as we read through that. So after having once again revealed, I'm Joseph, I'm your brother. How did Joseph address what I would consider to be the elephant in the room. Well, it's truly him. It's really me, guys. Remember, I'm the one you sold into slavery here. Guys, he's holding nothing back. He's telling them the truth. But he also revealed in that moment that, that they were afraid of, that they were worried about, that their actions are for, forgiven because this was all part of God's redemptive plan. Whatever they meant for evil, and they did, they meant this for evil. They were jealous of Joseph. They wanted to kill Joseph. Instead, they sold him into slavery and didn't care if maybe he was even dead. Then they lied to their father and said that a wild animal had killed him. 
Guys, they had deceived, they had lied, they had let hate destroy almost all of their lives. But look at what God did with it. God turned evil for good. Hmm. Isn't it amazing how he does that? So how could Joseph have forgiven these brothers so easily? How did he do that? Because that's hard to do. Well, he's right with God. All that time he had spent in prison, all that time he had spent probably wondering, why are my brothers doing this to me? And rather than holding them in contempt, he probably understood what was going on. Guys, he worked on his relationship with God. Rather than focusing on his own anger, resentment, plight, and his own righteousness, self-righteousness, and everything else dealing with self, Joseph focused on God and God's righteousness. You see, God revealed his glory to Joseph and allowed him to see God's hand at work. He knew, guys, I could be angry with you, but why would I be? God is in charge of all of this, and he did this so that our family would live. We would come through, and remember he says in this that he established you as a remnant within this land and to keep you alive. I just think that's amazing. So how does focusing on ourselves impact our walk with the Lord? How does, we're just looking at ourselves and what, what our own self-righteousness is telling us to do. But see, it leads to selfishness. It leads to pride. It leads to unforgiveness. It leads to sin, anger, all sorts of other bad emotions and feelings. See, life is hard, guys, and it's gonna be full of disappointment because we live in a broken, sinful world. All of us have been mistreated, and oftentimes by those who are to love us the most, oftentimes by those who are closest to us, those are the ones who hurt the most. It may be a family member. Yes, it may be a church brother or sister. It could very well be, and you could be right in saying, they did me wrong. But withholding forgiveness, it's not what God wants from us, guys. Because here's what happens. In our own sinfulness, we do not have the capacity to forgive in a situation like that. And guys, you know, I'm reminded of so many occasions. I'm reminded of, I, I keep going back to this, but that church in Charleston where that young man came in and he shot and killed people after they invited them into their Bible study. And then you heard people at trial say, we forgive him. Dylan Roof, I think, was the killer's name. And they, they said, look, we forgive him. We want God to forgive him. We don't have that capacity on our own, but God does. When we turn our emotions, fears, and anger over to the Lord, we're not relying on our own strength now, but on his. The God of the universe has more capacity to love, to sacrifice, and to forgive than we do. Let's lean on him in order to be able to do that. All right, let's look at the last set of verses. Return quickly to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me without delay. You can settle in the land of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, all you have. There I will sustain you for there will be five more years of famine. Otherwise, you, your household, and everything you have will become destitute. Look, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin can see that I'm the one speaking to you. Tell my father about all my glory in Egypt and about all you have seen and bring my father here quickly. Then Joseph threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin wept on his shoulder. Joseph kissed each of his brothers as he wept, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. It's a beautiful, beautiful scene taking place there of forgiveness and reconciliation. What did Joseph, though, demand that his brothers do? And it's go get dad. I want you to go get dad. Go get everything that you all own. Everything, people, all your families, all your flocks, everything you've got and bring it here. I will sustain you. I will take care of you. How awesome is that, guys? That is, that's what our God does for us, and we see it demonstrated in Joseph to his brothers here. Was this good news or bad news to the brothers to hear this? 
And I think on the surface, we look at it and go, this is great news. They're going to live. They're going to get to move. I guess it also had to have dawned on them that they're going to have to come clean to their father. Good news, Dad. We're safe and we've got food and we've got a place to go where we're going to be taken care of. By the way, we lied to you about Joseph. We planned to kill him. Instead, we sold him into slavery. And then we lied to you about what had happened. And we watched you grieve and not be able to be consoled. And you probably did that for years. Oops. But look at what God will do with grief. I wonder how he will react to the news that his dead son is actually alive and the most powerful man in Egypt. And I don't have to wonder that. Read the next couple of chapters. All right. So how did forgiveness impact Joseph and his brothers? Well, it brought about healing. Joseph let go of any negative feelings that he had, and he truly forgave his brothers. I love the picture of him hugging and crying with Benjamin. And as he cried, he was hugging each of his brothers and let them know how much he loved them. You know, he wasn't seeking anything from them. He didn't say, get down and demand my forgiveness. Guys, he wanted a loving relationship going forward. And I know many of you continue to hurt from damaged relationships. I know you've been done wrong. And guys, I, I simply can't relate. I, I don't relate to that. And I'm so grateful to God that I really can't relate to that. But I also know that there is a way forward. God demonstrated that for us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did that for you and me. Because all you have to do, and I say all, uh, like it's not much, but, but all we have to do is accept that gift and turn our lives over to him and live for him rather than ourselves. Pray that prayer and say, forgive me, God. I'm a sinner. I know I am. And I know that by following you, you will forgive my sin and cover it with the blood of Jesus. Guys, if you've never done that, I hope you'll do that. And whatever relationship you have, whatever anger and unforgiveness that you're holding right now, I hope you'll turn loose of that. And I hope you'll give that to God and allow him to work in your life and the one that you're holding that grudge against. God, that, guys, that's, that's my prayer for you. Love you. Take care. Thanks for tuning in.